Last month, my son Josh was on a United Airlines flight, and about halfway through the flight, the pilot comes on the intercom, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a real American hero on our flight today. The second man to ever step foot on the moon. We are so privileged to have as a passenger today, astronaut Edwin Buzz Aldrin. And the whole plane just burst into applause. And I said, well, Josh, did you see Buzz Aldrin on the flight? And he said, no, he was in first class apparently. And I was sitting back by the bathroom at the very back. So I didn't. But I did see his back as he left the terminal. I said, that's really cool. And he said, yeah, but the greatest thing is... For the rest of my life, I'll always be able to say, I once flew with Buzz Aldrin. (laughs) Well, that is pretty cool. Now, there's a famous NASA photograph that Buzz Aldrin took when he stepped onto the moon. And it's a photograph of his footprint. And you probably have seen it. This is it. Some people think it's Neil Armstrong's footprint, but it's not. That's Buzz Aldrin's footprint. And NASA tells us that Almost 50 years later, Buzz Aldrin's footprint is still there on the moon, totally intact. NASA also tells us that the footprints of the other astronauts who had the privilege of walking on the moon will be there for tens of millions of years because there's no wind or erosion on the moon. I mean, can you imagine having your footprint last for tens of millions of years. You know, you walk along a beach and your footprint lasts until the high tide. And maybe you're one of those very fortunate few who you've happened upon some wet cement and you were mischievous enough to take advantage of it and put your footprint in the cement thinking, you know what, this thing could last 100 years, my footprint. But it probably lasted about a day until the construction crew saw it and covered it back up. So, But to think, I mean, a footprint that lasts for tens of millions of years. How amazing. But even NASA says those astronaut footprints will one day be wiped out on the moon's surface by asteroids and meteorites that will certainly hit it at some time. Those footprints won't last forever. You were created, though, to make an eternal footprint with your life that not even an asteroid can wipe out. You were made for eternity. Somebody said, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. You're an eternal soul. And you were created for eternity. To live for eternity and do something with your one and only life that will last for all eternity. And that's why when we do just things that are temporary and we focus our whole life on the temporal, we feel completely empty on the inside and we have this gnawing of the soul, this aching of the soul that says there's got to be something more than this. And the good news is there is. You were made To leave an eternal footprint. To do something with your one and only life that will outlive you and last for all eternity. I'm glad that the passage we're going to study today tells us that there is something more. Isaiah 52, 7. Open your Bibles there and would you stand in honor of God's word? Because here we see that the scripture tells us how to leave an eternal footprint that can't be washed away by the tide of time. That no asteroid can wipe out. It tells us how we can leave an eternal footprint so that we come alive and bless all the people around us. We find out why we're here on this earth. And I want to welcome all you guys worshiping with us at our satellite campuses and everyone worshiping with us through our broadcast ministry and online ministry around the world, wherever you are, from the woodlands to the world. We're one church built on the word of God that changes lives. And so follow along with me because this is a powerful passage, one of my favorites in all Scripture. And God wants to do something powerful in your life through his word. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who preach and proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Dear God, I thank you that you reign that you are in charge, 
that you're in control. Even when it seems like at times things are spinning out of control, we know that you're totally in control. Not only of the situations in our lives, but the world. And that you have a purpose, Lord. And, and I also know that you want us to align our hearts with your purpose. You want us to get in tune with your purpose for our lives so that we can come alive and be a blessing to everyone around us. So we don't have to feel that emptiness of the soul. That we can be filled, Lord, with your purpose. And so I, I pray today that you'd help us understand this powerful passage so that we could align our hearts with yours and come alive. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. And I want you to underline the word beautiful in that verse. And underline the word feet. And draw a line connecting the two. Because he says, how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those. Beautiful feet. I mean, think about it for a moment. Has anyone ever told you that you have beautiful feet? I hope not. Somebody raised their hand. That's kind of scary. I mean, can you imagine walking along the beach and someone comes up to you and says, I, I, I just got to stop you. I, I just got to say that, I mean, has anyone told you you have the most beautiful feet? You think, weird. And you'd probably report them to security. Hopefully you would. I mean, you don't hear that very often. Yeah, I, I really like them. They're amazing. Oh, and they have beautiful feet. Now, you just don't hear that very often. Maybe it's beautiful hair, which I never get that compliment, or beautiful skin, or beautiful eyes, but beautiful feet. But we're talking about spiritually beautiful feet, and spiritually beautiful feet make a big footprint. And it's a footprint of blessing. Spiritual, spiritually beautiful feet they give a big blessing to everyone around the footprints. Everywhere their footprints go, they bring blessing with them. Blessing before them, blessing after them, blessing around them. They bless the people in their sphere. And so I, I want to know how to have beautiful feet because I want to have feet of blessing. I want to receive God's blessings and I want God to bless those around me. I want to have beautiful feet that make a lasting impact for all eternity. So how do we do that? First, we step into God's eternal purpose for all history. We step into God's eternal purpose for all history. An eternal purpose will outlive you, but a selfish purpose will die with you. And most people focus on a selfish purpose. They think maybe, oh, I'm doing this for others, but it really turns out to be something very temporary that's not going to last. I want us to break down this powerful passage, Isaiah 52, 7, really dig into it. Because there's so much that God wants us to grab and put into our lives, to bring power in our lives. It says, how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those, and let's look at the last part, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Underline the phrase, your God reigns. We said in our Heart for the House series that history is really his story. It's really God's story of redemption. God is redeeming humankind and building a forever family for all eternity. God is building a forever family. That's what he's about. That's what he's always been about. He's building a forever family, the church. He's bringing everyone who's willing into his forever family to rule and reign with him for all eternity. And we said that after Christ died, rose again, and he was getting ready to ascend to heaven, he told his followers, I'm going back to heaven, but I'm going to leave my spirit to live in you. And you're going to be my body, the church. You're going to be my hands to go to those and reach out and bring healing for those who are hurting. And you're going to be my voice to speak words of hope. And you're going to be my feet to walk to those who are broken and hurting. And you're going to accomplish my purpose in the world of bringing everyone who is willing, all the broken, all the hurting, all the hopeless into my forever family to rule and reign with me forever. That's God's eternal purpose. So the only hope for this hurting world is the church, the body of Christ, being the hands, the voice, and the feet of Jesus Christ. That's the only hope for healing in this hurting world. And when I align my heart with God's heart, when I align my life with God's purpose, and I see that God has placed me here 
for an eternal purpose to connect to a local church family and be the hands, the feet, and the voice of Jesus to bring people into his forever family, then I come alive. I connect everything to that. And when you connect everything to God's heart, you connect everything to God's purpose, you come alive. And you have beautiful feet that leave an imprint that can never be washed away. Well, let's look at it again. Isaiah 52, 7 also says, How beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who proclaim salvation. So to have beautiful feet, I have to proclaim salvation. Over the last 24 years, Woodland Church has proclaimed salvation and Jesus Christ is our only hope. There's no salvation in self-help books. There's only salvation in Jesus. There's no salvation in religion and following rules and rituals and regulations, there's only salvation in Jesus. And that's why the angel said to the shepherds on that first Christmas, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. For you see, if our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. If our greatest need had been knowledge, God would have sent us an educator. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. And I'm so thankful for that. We have a Savior, and I needed to be saved from my sins. I needed forgiveness and His grace. And I'm so thankful that this year alone, 1,917 people committed their life to Christ and their eternal destinies are forever changed. They were saved. Saved from their sins. Saved from a purposeless life. Saved from living apart from God from all eternity. I'm so thankful. Sometimes people say, well, Kerry, why do you talk about numbers? 1,917. Why do you talk about numbers? Because each one of those numbers represents a person that Christ died for. And who will be in heaven with him forever because of what God's doing through you at Woodland Church. That's an eternal impact. That's why our mission statement has always been to help people experience Jesus Christ rather than man's creation of religion. So they can grow strong in Christ and take this Christ experience to the world. It's to come into a relationship, not with religion, but with Jesus. And then to grow strong in him. And then to go back out to bring others into his forever family. Our mission statement aligns with God's heart. That's why God blesses. Our mission statement aligns with God's eternal purpose to bring people into his forever family. That's what it's all about. In Matthew 24, Jesus is answering his disciples' questions, and they're asking about the end of the world. And it's like, you know, we've heard all these rumors, like the end of the world. When is the end? When are the end times? When are the last days? You know, they're asking all these questions a lot of people ask today, you know, that want to know, and they're curious about it. You know, when is the rapture? Jesus, when are you coming back? When is the, when does it all end? And Jesus said, yeah, um, Let me just tell you, there are going to be some signs. There are going to be earthquakes, and they're going to get more frequent. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be false teachers that arise. There's going to be diseases that, you know, we don't have a cure for. There's going to be all these things that will be happening. But he said, that's not the big sign. Those are just the birth pains. Labor is on the way. Labor is happening, but delivery is on the way. That's not the big sign. That's just the birth pains, but... Here's the big sign, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Underline that word nations. That word in the Greek literally means people groups. Jesus is saying the last big sign before I return is the good news of my salvation will go out through all the world, and every people group in all the world will hear the gospel. Every people group in all the world will have a chance to come into my forever family. I'm holding off for that one, and then, boom, the end will come. Did you know, because of technology, internet, television, that that's actually possible? That the whole world and every people group 
can hear the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation? Did you know you're the first generation in all of human history in which Jesus could come back? Because the last big sign is being fulfilled. It's the first time in all of human history when the gospel is being proclaimed to the whole world. Just Woodland Church services alone, we have over, we're have we going into over 200 countries through our broadcast, 40 satellites carrying Woodland Church services all, all over the world. You're part of hastening the Lord's return and getting the gospel out so everyone can come into its forever family. Well, I, I want you to look again at Isaiah 52, 7, because... It says how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. So beautiful feet bring good news. Beautiful feet not only proclaim salvation, but they always bring salvation. You can't just share the good news. you got to show the good news too. you got to be Jesus to people. you got to go into their mess so they can hear your message. That's what Christ did for us. That's why we go all over the world to bring the message of Christ. Because we are the body. And we can't just proclaim salvation. We've got to show salvation through our works. We've got to show the love of Jesus. That's why this year we're feeding 85,000 people on a regular basis in Haiti and Kenya through our 21 Farmers Field Schools. It's amazing how that's just expanded. These Farmers Field Schools that God is using you to resource and to make such a difference. We give them this great seed and we train them in these agricultural principles and our agricultural scientist who's on the field and, and goes around and, and examines these, these fields and helps these farmers. We train them through the churches. That's where the classes are held. And it's been amazing because we don't want to just teach someone. We don't want to just give a fish. We want to teach people to fish. We don't give handouts. We get help up. And through the resources of this church and the training from this church, you're feeding 85,000 people on a regular basis, and it's getting ready to explode exponentially in all the areas that we do missions around the world. And this year alone, we planted 17 new churches in India that are now reaching 15,000 people that wouldn't have been reached. 15,000 people on a regular basis coming to these churches that you, Woodland Church, started in India. In 2017 alone, we helped over 520,000 Hurting people. There are over 100 ministries and missions. Everything from food, clothes, medical care, school supplies, rescue from human trafficking, clean water, benevolence for those who've lost their job. On and on I could go listing our ministries. But you've made a huge impact in this one year alone. Why? Because we believe in sharing the good news and showing the good news. Being Jesus to people. In Romans 10, 14, it says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. So here the apostle Paul is quoting Isaiah 52, 7. And he's saying, you got to tell them and you got to show them. Now look at it again. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who proclaim peace. Beautiful feet proclaim peace. But peace only comes through the cross. Peace only comes through the cross. That's why we lift up the cross of Christ at Woodland Church. We're not ashamed of the cross. Colossians 1, 20 says, For Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. It's the cross of Christ that saves us. His death on the cross for you see, there was this giant chasm between humankind and God. Perfect, holy God in heaven. His perfect place for perfect people. And here we are, sinful and broken. You know when Neil Armstrong put his left foot on the moon's surface in 1969. And he made the first footprint on the moon. He said that memorable line it's been repeated over and over again. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And I think about the one giant leap for God is God left his perfect home in heaven, his palace 
of perfection. And he came into our broken, sin-sick world in one giant leap and became a tiny baby. And he grew up so we could experience what God is like. And he would experience all the things that we go through. But the perfect Lamb of God then went to the cross and shed his perfect sinless blood to wash away all our sins. So that we could have peace with God. And now, because of his one giant leap, one giant leap for God, and now it's just one small step for each man and each woman. One small step of faith to receive what Christ has done on the cross. One small step of faith where the ground is level at the foot of the cross. One small step of faith to receive his free forgiveness and his grace in heaven one day because of what he's done. That's what the cross is all about. And I'm so thankful for the cross. It reminds me of a Christian comedian, um, uh, Dave Lowry, who, or Mark Lowry. He um, tells the story of when he was a kid, his parents took him to the Jesus movie. You know, it, it, The Passion of the Christ was the latest big Jesus movie. And, and then A.D. And, and all those movies that come out, you know, at Jesus. And, but years ago, there was the Jesus movie, and it was in the theaters. And, and he went, and he was about sixth grade, he said. And then he had a, a little brother who was, you know, just a little guy. He was about six or seven. And, and, and they were watching the movie, and when they were crucifying Christ on the cross, his little brother was just horrified. It was just too much for him to take. And he stood up on his theater chair, and he said, Stop! Stop! Stop killing Jesus! And Mark Lowry looked at him and said, shut up and sit down. If he doesn't die, we're all going to hell. <laughs> Never a truer statement. You know, we praise God for those nails. We praise God for that crown of thorns. We praise God for the cross of Jesus Christ. Our only hope is the cross of Christ. I'm so thankful for the cross. And so as we celebrate Christmas... Christmas and the manger always leads to the cross. It says in Isaiah 9, 6, speaking of Christmas, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. But you'll never have peace in your heart until the Prince of Peace rules and reigns in your heart. You'll never have peace in your marriage until the Prince of Peace is first place in your marriage. You'll never have peace in your family until the Prince of Peace rules and reigns in its first place in your family. And we'll never have peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace returns and sets up his kingdom. And we rule and reign with him forever. And so we step into God's eternal purpose. Then secondly, we step up in generosity and we pass the eternal hope to the next generation. If we're going to leave an eternal footprint, it's got to come through passing on the faith to the next generation. Because Christianity is just one generation away from extinction. And so we have to pass on our faith to the next generation. That's why we have 5,335 preschoolers, children, and teenagers in our church regularly. Learning how to fall in love with Christ, to grow strong in Christ, to stand against peer pressure. To follow God's purpose for their life. So thankful for that. And Psalm 145, 4, it says, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. At Woodland Church, we invest in this next generation to raise them up, to change the world, to pass on our genuine faith to them. Look at this next passage. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking to pastors, and he's saying, here's what you do, pastors. Here's what you have to do, pastors. Here's what you must do for your people's sake. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, who is that? Who, you know, who is that, those who are rich in this present world? You say, well, at least I'm off the hook on that. I'm not rich, Carrie. Yes, you are. If you live in America, you're rich compared to the rest of the world. You're in like the top 5% of the world. 
I mean, I, I've been all over the world, and half the world lives on less than $2 a day. So if you live in America and you're on welfare, you're, you're rich compared to the rest of the world and the 8 billion people that are living today. You're in the top percent. Isn't that amazing? But it says here, don't feel guilty about it. Because I'm rich, because you're rich, because we live in America, we're rich. But we shouldn't feel guilty about it. In fact, he says, you should enjoy what you have. And basically, he's saying, don't feel guilty about being rich. Don't feel guilty about being blessed as long as you do two things. Number one, you're content with what you have. You're not always wanting more. You're not discontent and grumbling, complaining. And secondly, you give generously. If you do those two things, it's okay. If you don't do those two things, you better be worried. Because one day there'll be a great reckoning. Well, we're all rich. So are you content with what you have and do you give generously? There's a third thing. Step up in faith and boldly seize this eternal moment. If I'm going to leave an eternal footprint, I've got to step out in faith and boldly seize this eternal moment. We're living in a moment in history, folks. It's a very, very dark time in our history. There's so much pain and hurt and brokenness and poverty and racism and crime. And there's just so much division, so much hurt, so much sin in our world today. So much war. But I want you to know it's the greatest time in the history of the world to be alive. Could it be that God placed you on this planet at this time because he wants you to be part of his eternal purpose? The most important time to be alive. Could it be that God put you by Woodland Church or put you in Woodland Church for this time, this moment in history, to seize this moment, to be a part of God's eternal purpose, to make an eternal footprint that will outlive you? You see, I thought I was just transferred here. For my job. No, that's how God got you here for your eternal purpose. God puts you in a place so that you can fulfill His purpose. And you're here for such a time as this. And whenever you give of your time, talent, and treasure to His eternal purpose, His forever family, the body of Christ, then you're doing something that will last for all eternity and build up treasure in heaven. And God says, I'll bring it back to you here too. I'll meet your needs. What a powerful thing. Look at this last verse, Isaiah 49. It says, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. He's saying, this is not the time to be timid. This is the time to shout the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone. To be bold, to take our stand for Jesus. To let everyone know about the good news. To preach the gospel of hope. Not the gospel of hate. But the gospel of hope and truth in Jesus Christ. That I am a sinner but he is the Savior. That's what we're doing here at Woodlands Church. You know when the tide of time washes all your footprints off this earth. And when the wind of time blows away all your birthdays. And everything you've attempted to do and to be is long forgotten. The only thing that's going to matter is what you did with Jesus and what you did for Jesus. That's it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's bow together. Dear God, I thank you that you rule and reign. And sometimes it looks like everything's spinning out of control. But Lord, we know you're still on the throne. And that your purpose will not fail. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And I pray for those who've never really experienced it, that they would just right now say this prayer to you in their hearts. Dear Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept your free gift of salvation and forgiveness of all my sins. I take a step of faith and receive all that you've done for me. Thank you for making peace for me on the cross. Peace with my past. Peace, Lord, in the future in heaven and peace Lord right now in my heart be the Lord of my life and Lord I thank you that we get as Christ followers a chance to give to you now we're only giving back to you some of what you've given us and we just thank you Lord for all that you've given us we can never thank you enough and Lord we thank you that we can give to you and you can take 
Lord, this earthly money, and you can exchange it into eternal treasure. Lord, what a privilege. We pray that you would do that. And, and Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us as we give to just put you first in our finances and everything that we do. I also pray, Lord, that you would just give back to us, Lord, as you promised, more than we could give for your glory and your kingdom to be built. In Jesus' name, amen.